He was found dead in a remote area of New Mexico 503 at the age of 13. Fragile and innocent, he became the victim of an evil person within his own family. The tragedy began in 2017, and for two months, his murderer left no trace of his death. His existence was a beacon of light amidst darkness, but he was subjected to horrifying torture before being mercilessly slain. However, justice finally prevailed in 2018. On January 25, 2018, the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office received distressing information. An unnamed prisoner informed jail officials that her cellmate had confided in her, revealing that her boyfriend had murdered her 13-year-old son. She claimed that she was coerced into assisting in moving her own son's remains. Just imagine the terror a mother must have felt in such a situation. Acting on this shocking revelation, the police went to the specified location and discovered a body buried inside a plastic tub in a shallow grave. According to the authorities, the body was found wearing a diaper, with certain portions completely burned. This case prompts us to contemplate the depths of human evil and the heinous actions that some fathers are capable of. So let's delve deeper into today's case. Tracy Ann Pena, born on December 6, 2003, in New Mexico, gave birth to her second child, a poor little soul named Jeremiah Valencia. His father's name was Andrew Valencia. Jeremiah was a quiet kid who loved to play with the family dogs. He enjoyed music, cars, sports, and especially Batman. Jeremiah also had a knack for building things, tinkering with mechanics, and often had tools in his hand. He was a bright child with a promising future as a mechanic or in any field he chose. Everything seemed fine in Jeremiah's life. However, in 2011, when Jeremiah would have been about eight years old, his mother, Tracy, came under investigation by the New Mexico CYFD for accusations of abuse and neglect. As a result, Jeremiah and his sister were adopted by their aunt and uncle, who applied for legal guardianship. However, only a few months later, custody of Jeremiah and his sister was given to their grandparents. But somehow, the siblings ended up back with their mother, Tracy. Jeremiah attended Carlos Gilbert Elementary School in Santa Fe. At the end of 2016, he was enrolled in middle school in the West Las Vegas School District. Things started to worsen from then on. In February of 2017, his mother took him and his sister out of school, telling school officials that they were returning to school in Santa Fe. However, Jeremiah never showed up for any classes after that, and school officials never followed up to check whether he was attending school or not. This mistake cost the life of a 13-year-old kid. Later in 2017, Tracy and her two children moved to the town of Nambi, New Mexico. At that time, unfortunately, Jeremiah's father and mother were no longer together. Tracy was joined by her new boyfriend, Thomas Ferguson, in June of that year. Thomas had a few children from previous relationships, including his 19-year-old son, Jordan Nunez. According to the police, there were three prime suspects at the time Thomas, Tracy, and Jordan, but none of them had a specific reason for killing Jeremiah. Then, how did they kill Jeremiah? For an answer, let's take a short overview of their past. In all aspects, Thomas was a horribly abusive man. In 2003, he was convicted of beating his wife at the time, as well as hitting, choking, and kicking her while she held their eight-month-old daughter. In 2014, he was convicted of kidnapping, assaulting, and beating his girlfriend on Valentine's Day. After he pleaded guilty to those charges, he was sentenced to nearly nine years in prison. Thomas X, Amanda Nunez, the mother of Jordan, somehow managed to live with Thomas for 16 years. She married him when she was only 14 years old. If this sounds like a joke to you, keep in mind that New Mexico has no official minimum age for marriage, but they require parental consent or approval from a court for minors. On the topic of Thomas, Amanda said I was an obsession. I wasn't even a person. I was just his thing he liked to beat on. According to Amanda, she had three miscarriages because Thomas beat her so badly that he almost left me dead several times. The next thing that I am going to tell you will freak you all out of your mind and will explain the brutality of Thomas. Amanda said that he punched Jordan in the chest when he was only two months old, something that could have easily killed a baby of that age. Jordan's birth name was Julian, but when Amanda finally left Thomas, she changed his name to Jordan to prevent Thomas from finding them. Suppose you have to change your name in order to protect yourself from someone. How terrifying this situation could be for anyone. It is unknown how Jeremiah's mother, Tracy, ended up in a relationship with Thomas. Thomas transferred his abusive behavior from one family to the next when they moved in together in 2017. Jeremiah was now 13 years old. 
Thomas began missing check-ins with his probation officer, and in July of 2017, probation and parole officers visited the home in Namby to try to make contact with him. However, they didn't manage to speak to him because they were afraid of the pit bulls in the yard. In August of 2017, Thomas was declared an absconder from probation. On November 21st, a bench warrant was issued for his arrest. Tracy was also having almost routine minor criminal offenses. She's recently been convicted on charges of drug possession. He failed to appear in court for one of these criminal charges. She was arrested on November 24th, 2017, and held for two days. On January 7th, 2018, both Thomas and Tracy were again arrested and held in the Santa Fe County Jail. He was locked for his probation violations, and she was locked on yet another warrant for failure to appear in court. Thomas Jordan had a lonely past. Jordan ended up living in 11 different homes in the first 11 years of his life, including state custody between the ages of six and nine. He eventually ended up living at his grandparents' house before voluntarily leaving them at the age of 18 to go and live with his father, Thomas, in New Mexico. From here, the investigation started, and all of them had their own story. After receiving this information from Tracy's own inmate, a detective listened to recorded jail telephone conversations between Tracy and Thomas, where Tracy told him that she misses and cries for her son every day. When questioned by cops about why she committed such a horrible crime, Tracy told the whole story. She told cops that after she had been released from jail on November 26th, she came home and went to Jeremiah's room. There, she found him dead, wrapped in a blanket. She informed Thomas, who placed the body in his vehicle and drove away. Tracy told cops that on December 6th, Jeremiah's birthday, Thomas took her to a location on New Mexico Route 503, just a few miles from their house in Namby. They then walked a short distance from the highway, where Thomas said Jeremiah was buried nearby. When Thomas was questioned, he told his own side of the story. He told investigators that he was sleeping when he heard a noise outside his bedroom door. It was Jeremiah and Thomas's son Jordan playing aggressively with him. Thomas said that he noticed that Jeremiah appeared to be injured. He said he helped Jeremiah get into bed and covered him with a blanket. When Tracy returned home and told him that Jeremiah was not responding, Thomas tried unsuccessfully to perform CPR. Imagine if your son is injured. What should you do in that situation? You should call an ambulance, but Thomas's answer will shock you. When he was confronted by the cops, that's why he didn't call the police or an ambulance. He said he didn't call law enforcement because he was afraid of being accused of being involved in the murder. At the time, he even denied removing Jeremiah's body from the home but claimed to know who did it. When 19-year-old Jordan was interviewed, he initially told investigators that Thomas had taken Jeremiah to an uncle's house in Mora. But in frustration, he changed his story and told another version of his own story. He said that Thomas had punched Jeremiah in the face and stomach multiple times, dragged him into the back of the house, and locked the door. Jordan said he heard loud music coming from his father's room for the rest of the evening. He said that Thomas put padlocks on all the doors to stop anyone from leaving. But Jeremiah's sister told a whole different but true story. According to a police affidavit, Jeremiah's younger sister told the police an even more harrowing story about their lives in the months leading up to Jeremiah's death. When describing life with Thomas, Jeremiah's sister said it was hard. She said that Thomas would force Tracy to abuse her son when he didn't feel like bothering to do it himself. Like such a pure, evil person who forced his girlfriend to torture her own children. Jeremiah's sister told the investigators that one day in November, she and Thomas were supposed to go and pick up Tracy from jail. For no reason, Thomas got angry at Jeremiah and locked him in the plastic dog crate. After Jeremiah fell asleep in the crate, Thomas's son Jordan began flipping the crate to wake Jeremiah. Jordan then pulled Jeremiah out of the crate, and Jeremiah's head was just kind of dangling. Jeremiah never woke up. According to Jeremiah's sister, her brother was in a very horrible condition when he died. She said he was really skinny, and all his cuts were infected. He had a black eye, and his tooth was knocked out. She also told police that Thomas and his son Jordan put Jeremiah's body in the bathtub to wash the blood off before placing him on his bed, where Tracy later found him. When describing life with Thomas, Jeremiah's sister said it was hard. She said that Thomas would force Tracy to abuse her own son when he didn't feel like bothering to do it himself. On Jeremiah's last day, he was punched, choked, held against a wall, and turned upside down while Thomas slammed his head on the ground. Then he was locked back into the dog crate, where he eventually died. Like such a pure, evil person who forced his girlfriend to torture her own children. In later interviews, Jordan also revealed more details about how Jeremiah was tortured before his death. 
He told the police that his father would beat Jeremiah with brass knuckles, a cane, and steel-toed boots. Jeremiah would have a five-pound sledgehammer dropped on his fingers, and it was often used as target practice for their homemade spear. Jordan confirmed that Jeremiah was frequently locked in a dog crate, but also told how Jeremiah was forced to wear an adult diaper, and that Thomas would urinate on Jeremiah for no reason. He would say things like, if the dogs are starving, I'll starve Jeremiah. Like, can you imagine the level of torture Jeremiah was facing? Tracy later changed her original story and said that Jeremiah's body had been kept in the garage for three days. She claimed that Thomas locked her and Jordan in the garage, where they wrapped Jeremiah's body in plastic and duct tape, placing him in a large plastic storage unit. Then Tracy, Thomas, and Jordan drove to a remote area of New Mexico Route 503. Thomas literally forced Tracy to watch while he and Jordan dug a hole where they would eventually bury the plastic tub containing Jeremiah. When police arrived at that location, Jeremiah's body was found wearing a diaper, just like Jordan said. He had multiple old and new injuries, explaining how he had been beaten and tortured before his death. The report detailed the many injuries that Jeremiah had. These included multiple jaw fractures, a dislocated eyeball, rips in his scalp, cheek and ear, and a broken hand and rib. His jaw was so badly broken that the bone was poking through his gums. The examination was limited by the decomposition of his remains, since Jeremiah's body was not recovered until nearly two months after his death. A search of the family's home found blood evidence consistent with Jeremiah's sister's account. They used a special light to find blood that was not visible to the naked eye in both Thomas's bedroom and Jeremiah's bedroom. A plastic dog crate measuring just 26 by 39 inches was later found at the home of one of Jordan's cousins and was confirmed to be the crate used in Jeremiah's death. On January 29, 2018, Thomas, who was still in jail, was formally accused of Jeremiah's death. On February 18, he was indicted by a grand jury on 18 felony charges, including first-degree homicide, kidnapping, child abuse, and tampering with evidence. For whatever reason, child abuse was not among these charges. On April 11th, he was sentenced for violating his parole conditions for his previous kidnapping charge from 2014. He would have remained in jail until roughly January 2024 for his previous crimes. However, now he would also be awaiting trial for the homicide of Jeremiah. Tracy and Jordan were both arrested and charged with several crimes. On March 7th, Tracy was indicted by a grand jury on 12 charges, including intentional child abuse resulting in death tampering with evidence, conspiracy to commit evidence tampering, and obstructing a report of child abuse or neglect. On April 3, 2018, Jordan was indicted by a grand jury on 13 charges, including felony counts of intentional child abuse resulting in death, tampering with evidence, and a misdemeanor for obstructing a report of child abuse or neglect. An autopsy performed on Jeremiah's body confirmed that the 13-year-old boy had died from blunt force trauma. Thomas was found dead in his jail cell at the Santa Fe County Detention Center at around 11 p.m. on April 27, 2018. He had been alone in a segregated unit with increased patrol. Officers at the unit conducted checks every 30 minutes. However, Thomas was able to hang himself with a bed sheet. District Attorney Marco Cerna said that Thomas did this to avoid taking responsibility for what he had done. So this was the end of pure evil. Jeremiah's father, Andrew Valencia, organized a five-year anniversary vigil in November of 2022, the same year that Jeremiah would have graduated high school if he were still alive. Andrew, who hadn't seen Jeremiah since his son was six years old, recalls that Jeremiah was a happy little kid. He said he was always an active kid. It's a tragedy. He had a good future. I know he did. Just remember him. It's not about anything else. He still lives every day in my life, in my heart, and in others. After studying this case, we can conclude how much evil a person can be. Some people don't care about your life. They only want their mental pleasure by hurting you. Please stay away from such people. Take care of yourself and your family. We'll be back with another mysterious true crime documentary.